welcome again to the Mitra. Our study today is going to be part two of, of something we started last week on the Ten Words, or otherwise more commonly known as the Ten Commandments. And yet the scriptures don't really call them the Ten Commandments. That's just a tradition that we've that somebody started and we've all continued to follow. And so we call these instructions that were given at Sinai the Ten Commandments, and yet the scriptures in three different places in the Torah call them the Ten Words or the Ten Matters. The Hebrew word here is Devarim. Devarim um, has a variety of uses that could be translated word or matter or thing. It also refers to the person who manifests the presence of Elohim that we commonly and currently know as our Messiah. Because in the beginning was the Word, and that's the word Devarim in the, in the Hebrew Scriptures. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Elohim, and the Word was Elohim. And so Elohim manifested himself to his people of long ago, to Abraham and the patriarchs and the prophets and the kings, uh, all throughout the history of Israel, manifesting as the Word you, you'll read in places, the word of Elohim spoke to Abraham. The word of Elohim appeared to Abraham. And so this davar, this word, appeared and, and manifested the presence of the Almighty, walking with people as he did in the garden back in the beginning. Elohim desires to walk with us and to manifest himself to us, to reveal the secret things of Elohim to us so that we can know and understand uh, where he's taking us and so that we can know and understand how much he values each one of us as, as grafted in, as adopted sons and daughters into the kingdom. And so, so today we're going to look at the ten words, part two, exploring the significance of the ten words in our covenant relationship with Elohim. All right, so the covenant, and just a, a couple of slides for a review from last week to bring us up to speed. The covenant is the ten words. When Father appeared to Moshe um, and to the children of Israel who were at the foot of the mountain at Mount Sinai, Father um, told Moshe to tell the people that he was going to bring a word that, you know, in three days. And so he took it to the elders, and the elders responded that whatever Yahuwah spoke, you know, we will do the, these things. And so an agreement was made even before the ten words, the instructions of the covenant were given. So our ancestors agreed to this covenant. Now a covenant is an agreement, or it's a contract between two parties. This, this uh, giving of the ten words was a contract, an agreement, we call it a covenant, but we have to understand that it's an agreement between Elohim and his people. And so each party in that agreement have obligations. Elohim has obligated himself to be our Elohim, to protect us, to provide for us, uh, to, uh, to bless us in the field, and, uh, and in everything we put our hands to, to bless us in the womb, and to cause all of our animals to produce. And that none of the curses that came upon Mitzrayim or Egypt would come upon his people as long as we remained faithful in our covenant relationship to him. And for our part, for the, the people's part, we agreed to obey him, to let him be Elohim, to let him be Lord, and we would walk in his commandments and do the things that he instructed us to do. And so it says he wrote on the tablets. When Moshe went up on the mountain uh, with the two stone tablets, this was a little bit after the Sinai uh, uh, day, the, the day of, uh, what was it, Shavuot, as we call it now, the, the Feast of Weeks. So Moses was called up the mountain, and it says the father wrote on the tablets that Moshe brought up with him the words of the covenant, the ten matters, the ten things. Um, in Hebrew, uh, aseret ha-devarim, the ten words, the ten matters. 
And so the ten matters are the essence of the covenant. They're the content of the agreement that we have made with Elohim. He declared to you in another place, Devarim, uh, Deuteronomy 4.13, it says, He declared to you His covenant, the ten matters which He commanded you to follow, and then He wrote them on two stone tablets. And again in Devarim, Deuteronomy 10.4, Yahweh wrote on these tablets what He had written before. This is because Moshe, when He came down and He saw the people in rebellion, He threw the tablets on the ground and shattered them because Yahuwah was angry with his people who had uh, decided that they were going to follow the ways of the nations around them and, and, and form a golden calf to bow down and worship before the golden calf. So, uh, so Moshe was called back up on the mountain to bring two more tablets and Yahuwah said he would write on those tablets again the ten matters. So Yahuwah wrote on these tablets what he had written before the ten matters he had proclaimed to you on the mountain, out of the fire, on the day of the assembly. That was Shavuot. And Yahweh gave them to me, Moshe says. And so here are the ten matters. And we discussed last week, and I'm going to just quickly point out to you that I'm following a little different uh, numbering of the commandments or the words because I believe that uh, the Deuteronomy 5 version is the correct version. It's the original version and that the, the version that's given to us in Exodus 20 uh, had a, a scribal mistake in it. And so it reads just a little bit differently than the Deuteronomy 5 version. We know that they're both speaking of the exact same words that Father spoke to the people from the mountain. And these words were written on stone so there, there can't be two different versions, although what we're presented in the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, there's just a, a slight discrepancy in how they are written down. And the reason this can happen is because scribes are human beings. The scribes were responsible for copying manuscripts, and it was a very arduous and meticulous task. And sometimes, as human beings, they made mistakes. And Usually what they did in the, in the Hebrew Masoretic text, which we have today, uh, the scribes, when they recognized that a previous scribe had made a mistake in copying the manuscript, they won't correct the manuscript. They'll copy the manuscript as it was written in error, and then they'll put an, an insertion in there saying that this is what it's supposed to read. And they call that kathiv, Kathiv means that which is written. In other words, the scribe found this particular spelling of a word written, Kathiv, and then the scribe will insert an editorial kare, or it is read this way. In other words, the scribe is correcting the manuscript. So you have the Kathiv kare, the, that which is written, that, that which is read, or how we are to read it, because it's, it's clearly uh, a grammatical error, an error in transcription of the, of the manuscripts. And so you find that throughout the Hebrew Scriptures is that you have these corrections when one scribe recognizes that a previous scribe made an error. And so instead of, well, again, just to, to repeat, instead of correcting the Hebrew manuscript, they don't want to tamper at all with the manuscript they received, so they just insert an editorial uh, saying this is the way it was supposed to have read, so that nothing's lost. And, it, and if that scribe is an error about what he thinks was a mistake, he's not erasing something or omitting something from the Hebrew manuscript. So it was a very careful and methodical way of preserving the Hebrew text as best they can, even though know, there were sometimes human errors involved in the copying of the manuscripts. So that's what I think happened here in the Ten Words. The, the Exodus 20 version uh, ascribed inserted in what was the ninth or the tenth commandment, and I, and I think that the, the last two are together. In the Exodus version it says, do not desire your neighbor's house, do not desire your neighbor's wife, and then do not desire, or it doesn't say do not desire again, it says do not desire your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's ox or his 
or his donkey, and it names a couple other things. The original, which is found in Deuteronomy 5, says, first, do not desire or lust after your neighbor's wife. And that's a separate matter. It's the ninth matter of the ten matters. And then the tenth matter is do not desire your neighbor's house or his ox or his, uh, all the other things of your neighbor. And it uses a different verb there. And so that's why you have what appears to be a discrepancy in the version in, in Exodus 20 and the version of uh, Deuteronomy 5. So I'm following the Deuteronomy 5 version. And so therefore the first matter is about worshiping Elohim. Um, the, the typical or traditional way of numbering these ten matters is to say the first one is you shall have no other gods before me from verse 7 and then 8 you shall not make for yourself an idol and, and I think that those are all one matter that, that they're one issue that the Father is explaining to us the issue is how do we worship Him we're not to have other Elohim and or make something to represent, to be a representation of, of an Elohim. And all of this is one issue that Father is dealing with. So here's how it reads in an English translation of Deuteronomy 5. Matter number one, I am Yahweh your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim from the house of slaves. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them. You shall not serve them. And those are four separate commandments in this matter number one. Is you shall have no other gods. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not bow down and you shall not serve them. Four commandments making up the one issue, the first issue of the ten. For I, Yahweh, your Elohim, am a jealous Elohim, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation, of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations. The word generations there is provided into the translation because it, that word isn't there in the Hebrew, but we understand that the, that's what the, the thousand is referring to. Showing love, Yahweh show love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. And that's the end of the first matter. The second matter, you shall not lift up the name of Yahweh your Elohim unto emptiness, for Yahweh will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Three, guard the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as Yahweh your Elohim has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to Yahweh your Elohim. You shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor the alien within your gates, so that your manservant and maidservant may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Mitzrayim, and that Yahweh your Elohim brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and therefore Yahweh your Elohim has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. And so in this third matter, we have, again, I think four. Uh, let, let's count them. The first commandment is guard the Sabbath day. Secondly, six days you shall labor. Third, and do all your work. That's a separate instruction. It's a separate commandment. That's the third. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to Yahweh your Elohim. And the fourth commandment here is you shall not do any work. And nobody in your household or none of your animals are to do any work. And the fifth commandment here is to remember that you were slaves in Mitzrayim, which gives us an understanding of the reason that Father gave us the Sabbath commandment, is that he was the one that saved us and our ancestors, and he's the one that delivers his people. He has the power, and we don't have the power to provide salvation for ourselves. And that's a theme that runs from all the way from the beginning all the way through the New Testament, is that we can't save ourselves. It's Yahuwah who saves us. And because of that ability and that power and that authority to save his people, he can command us to keep the seventh day holy. And so that's why we need to be doing it, because he's Elohim. 
and he's instructed us. And, and what, what gives him the right, again, is, is not only his power, but the fact that he did all this for us. He's the one that saved us and rescued us from, from that which kept us in chains. And so, because of that, we remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. The fourth commandment. Those first three uh, relate to how we are to worship and understand our Elohim. We're not to have any other Elohim. We're not to misuse or lift up his name in vain. And we're to keep his Sabbath day holy because he created that for us as a day of blessing. And the rest of the commandments have to do with our relationship with one another. Beginning with number four, honor your father and your mother as Yahweh your Elohim has commanded you so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land that Yahweh your Elohim is giving you. The fifth matter is you shall not murder. The sixth, you shall not commit adultery. The seventh, you shall not steal. The eighth, you shall not bring against your neighbor a false witness. And then the last two, number nine and ten, are issues of the mind. We can transgress with, in, our, in our actions, in our hands, but we can also transgress his law by our minds, by what we're thinking, by what we're allowing in, and what we're meditating and dwelling on. And those two matters are about desiring something that doesn't belong to us. Number nine, you shall not lust after your neighbor's wife. And this is a separate commandment because, because Yahuwah puts a much higher value in human life than he does in stuff, in things, in property. And so Yahuwah wants, it to, wants us to understand very clearly that uh, our neighbor's wife is off limits to any man. And number 10, you shall not set your desire, again a different verb, lust in verse 9, set your desire in verse 10, on your neighbor's house or land, his manservant, maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So those are the 10, and that's the way uh, I'm going to teach it. Here's the thing, you don't have to agree with the, the way that I've numbered the 10 matters, but I'm presenting presenting it this way because I believe that that's the correct understanding of the numbering of the ten matters. So you can think about that and meditate and decide for yourself whether the, the numbering that I am presenting is, is the true one, the, the, yeah, the accurate one, the one that was originally given for the reasons that I've explained. And, or, or you can you know, continue with the traditional numbering that is usually taught in most other places of worship. So Exodus 20. We're going to deal today with just the first three matters because I have way too many slides and way too much to say to squeeze all of these ten matters into this one teaching today. <coughs> uh, you know, we'd be, we'd be teaching, I'd be teaching till four o'clock if I were to do that. And we probably don't want to go that long. So we're going to just deal with the first three. We're going to talk about the meaning of these instructions. We're going to look at other commandments of the Torah that hang off of these. Because didn't the Messiah say, say that uh, the two greatest commandments were to love Elohim with all your heart, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, all of the Torah and prophets hang off of these two commandments. And so these ten are a, a further breakdown of, of loving Elohim, loving one another, and these ten describe how we are to relate to Elohim, the first three, and the last seven, how we are to relate and, and get along with one another, the instructions. So, so we're also going to look at other instructions that hang off of these ten and see like a further explanation of what these commandments are summarizing. Because these are in, in, in one sense of it, a summary of the instructions that Father wants us to follow. The, these ten matters are summary matters. But there is further detail given throughout the Torah. And so we're going to look at a, a few of those as well today. So, let's see. Oh, this is the Exodus verse. I'm going to skip this. This is just uh, showing you the, the differences between the Deuteronomy 5 and the Exodus 20 version. 
in Exodus 20, uh, nine, manners 9 and 10 are bunched together here because the first, it was taken out of order. The scribe copied, you should not covet your neighbor's house first instead of you should not covet your neighbor's wife. And so it got a little bit out of order and, and it made it confusing to separate numbers 9 and 10. But the Deuteronomy 5 version, again, is, is the correct version. So the first matter we're going to deal with, worshiping Elohim. I am Yahweh, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, or Egypt, from the house of slaves. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them, and you shall not serve them. For I, Yahweh, your Elohim, am a jealous Elohim, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandment. Now there seems to be a, a discrepancy between this description of punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generations. Because in the book of Ezekiel, it makes it crystal clear that the father, the, the son never has to pay for the sins of the father, nor does the son inherit the father's righteousness, that each individual is responsible for their own behavior and will answer for their own behavior. So, so the children don't actually get punished for their father's sin. The children get punished for their own sin. Because typically what happens is the father passes down his sin, sins, his wayward ways, to the next generation. The next generation picks up on it and repeats the same sins. And so that's what is meant here by punishing the children for the sin of the fathers, for the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. What he's saying is, is that those generational sins will, will keep moving down the generational line until somebody says, hey, wait, I'm not going to live like my father did. I'm going to repent and Hallelujah. return to Elohim. Hallelujah. So the father is going to punish generation after generation of, of, of people that are, are uh, willingly uh, walking in the footsteps of their mother and father and the sins of their mother and father and will get punished for their own sin not for the sin of their mother and father but that's what they learned it from and so that therein lies the importance of training our children in the ways of Yahweh and teaching them the right path to walk in of course those who are in disobedience are not going to teach their children and so the children are going to repeat the errors and the sins of their mother and father. And then on goes that generational curse. Because Yahuwah is going to punish each generation if they continue in those things. But, on the other hand, for those who love Him and keep His commandments, He promises to show love up for a thousand generations. In other words, the love will never end. It will just keep going down the generations. If we faithfully teach our children, the ways of Yahuwah, the way He's instructed us, and they decide to walk in those ways, and they grow up and teach their children to walk in the ways of Yahuwah, that blessing and that love from Yahuwah will continue from generation to generation up to a thousand. And a thousand isn't, isn't like the limit of His love to only a thousand generations. It, what it's really saying is that that love will continue on forever throughout the generations, because if you do a, a summary of the genealogies since Adam, <coughs> I think there have only been something like 400, and that's off the top of my head, there have only been 400 generations of people since creation over, over 6,000 years. You can do your own calculations, you can use the word, the number 20 for a generation and just, and just calculate it and see how many generations there have been. So we haven't even begun to approach the thousand generation limit of the blessing and the love that Yahweh will show to those who love Him. Nevertheless, it's there to emphasize the fact that Yahweh's love never ends to those who love Him and keep His commandments. The first instruction for the Mighty One of fame and renown 
and he's call, he calls himself and, and introduces himself as Yahweh, your Elohim, because that's the the name that uh, that he introduced himself to Moshe at the burning bush. He introduced himself as Yahweh, I am who I am. Tell them that Yahweh has sent you, to, you know, to, to Pharaoh. And so he says, this is my name and my renown forever. That Yahweh is to be his name, it's his name of remembrance. We're to know him by his name. So the mighty one uh, of fame and renown, meaning Yahweh, uh, gave this instruction, you shall have no other gods before me. The Hebrew word here uh, usually translated God in many English Bibles, in which we are transliterating as Elohim, is uh, here the Hebrew word Elohim. And while the exact root meaning of Elohim is uncertain, it is usually understood as meaning mighty or mighty one. This word most often is used as a designation of the Creator, but it's also used in the Tanakh or the, or the Old Testament for men, leaders in the community of Israel. They're called Elohim, the mighty people. Uh, it could be used of angels, it could be used of warriors, the mighty warriors uh, in Israel or even of other nations. They're called Elohim. And so the world picked up on the term Elohim and they began to call their mighty warriors, the, the mighty ones among them, them the leaders, gods or Elohim. And so as in the Hebrew, the word Elohim can mean both. It can refer to, to the one that, is, that created all. It can also refer to other powerful or mighty individuals. And so as the word God is used in English, it's, it's very similar in its usage. So next, the phrase usually rendered before me, you shall have no other gods before me. In this command is the Hebrew al-panab. It means up in my face. You shall not have any other, other gods. Up in my face. In other words, uh, competing against me is the idea. Up in, up in Father's face. If, if I may pray, uh, paraphrase, as I wrote in the slide, don't bring some other so-called God and put him in my face. Don't bring him to compete up against me. Because they're not, in, they're not true gods. They're not even on the same level. You know, if, if we attribute authority and power to an evil spirit or, or even to Satan, uh, the comparison is like apples and oranges because Father is much more powerful. The Father can create with, uh, with his spoken word. And uh, the creation is not able to do that. And Satan was created and all other... Uh, what are called mighty ones or gods are created beings <coughs> that men want to that want to attribute authority or power to. And so don't bring those things up in his face, he's saying. I am Yahuwah and Yahuwah is Elohim. There is no other. There is no other Elohim. All the rest of the Elohim of the nations are imaginary deities. <coughs> They don't really exist um, the way that they're presented. There may be spirits, there may be evil spirits that are working behind the scenes to, uh, to convince people that there's power in these idols or in these deities. But the reality is that, is that these idols and deities have no power at all. Um, they're, just, they're just other spirits. Um, hiding behind some object and pretending to have power. They only exist in the minds and thoughts of men. What, what people are really worshiping are evil spirits when they worship idols. So in a, Isaiah, <coughs> excuse me. In Isaiah, Yeshayahu, 45, uh, there's a scripture that says, I am Yahuwah, and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no Elohim. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, <coughs> men may know that there is none besides me. I am Yahuwah, 
and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, Yahweh, do all these things. And so if we're attributing to the, to the evil one things that are done, we have to recognize that Yahweh created the evil one and he created disaster. <coughs> and sometimes he'll give permission as his servant to the evil one to bring a curse, to bring something bad into our lives because we're not obeying him. So these curses come. You know, Job would be the primary example of that. Father gave Satan permission uh, to do the things to Job that he did. Satan had to ask. He couldn't just do whatever he wanted. And so fa the Father is the one who creates disaster, but he also creates prosperity. He does all of these things. And, <coughs> and everything else is his servant. Again, in Isaiah 45, verse 18, For this is what Yahweh says, He who created the heavens, <clears throat> He is Elohim. He who fashioned and made the earth, He founded it. <coughs> Thank you. He did not create it to be empty. He's talking about the heavens and the earth. He formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am Yahweh and there is no other. So here over and over again by the prophet Isaiah, the emphasis is made that there is none like him. There is no other like him, that he is Elohim. And he is the one that is in control and in charge. He is the true Lord and Elohim of heaven and earth. So the second command in this first matter of the Ten Matters regarding who the true Elohim is says that you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. <clears throat> the Hebrew word there is pesel. Uh, we translate that as idol or image. It comes from the root pesel, which means to hew or to carve out. So it literally means it's this object that somebody has carved out or fashioned with his hands, whether of metal or of wood or of ceramic or glass or whatever substance people use to, to make these images. That's what a pestle is. That's what an idol is. It's just a hewed out image. It refers to anything carved, cut, hewn, or formed into some particular shape. The work of a craftsman. So of what value, Habakkuk says this in chapter 2, Habakkuk says of what value is an idol, same word, Pesel, since a man has carved it. Is there, is there any real value as a god in something that man has carved out with his own hands? Or an image that teaches lies, for he who makes it trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak literally dumb, worthless things. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life, or to the lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver. There is no breath in it. But, in Psalm 115, we're told, our Elohim is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. Thank you. But their idols are silver and gold made by the hands of men. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but they cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear. Noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but cannot feel. Feet, but they cannot walk. Nor can they utter a sound with their throats. And those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. Because they're nothingness. They're dead. They're lifeless. So people that make them and worship these idols, Father is promising that they're going to be dead too. They're going to be lifeless. That's going to be their end result. In Devarim 9, we're told, not only are we commanded not to carve such an image, but in case we still don't understand, he tells us you shall not bow down to them. You shall not serve them. 
if, if what was said previously is still unclear, then, then he clarifies it here. This means not to lower yourself, stoop down, or bow down to these images and idols. We are not to pay homage to them or adore them, and it means we are not to be a slave or servant to them. Since they do not hear or do anything, we are not to make our prayers and requests to them. Whatever superstition requires of us in the presence of these idols, we are not to perform. Again, back to Isaiah 44. Just to drive this point home a little further, because Father is the one that's driving the point home. I'm just reading what is written here. So he goes on to say, Do not tremble, do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any Elohim besides me? No. no. There is no other rock. I know not one. All who make idols are nothing, and the things they treasure are worthless. Those who would speak up for them are blind. They are ignorant to their own shame. Isaiah continues. Who shapes a god and casts an idol which can profit him nothing? He and his kind will be put to shame. Craftsmen are nothing but men. Let them all come together and take their stand, and they will be brought down to terror and infamy. The blacksmith takes a tool and works with it in the coals. He shapes an idol with hammers. He forges it with the might of his arm. He gets hungry and loses his strength, and he drinks no water and grows faint. The carpenter measures with a line and makes an outline with a marker. He roughs it out with chisels and marks it with compasses, compasses, and he shapes it in the form of a man, a man of a man in all his glory, that it may dwell in a shrine. He cuts down cedars, or perhaps took a, a cypress or oak. He let it grow among the trees of the forest, or planted a pine, and the rain made it grow. It is man's fuel for burning. Some of it he takes and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. But he also fashions a god and worships it. He makes an idol and bows down to it. Half of the wood he burns in the fire. Over it he prepares his meal. He roasts his meat and eats his fill. He also warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm, I see the fire. And from the rest he makes a god, his idol. He bows down to it and worships. He prays to it and says, Save me, you are my god. This is pure foolishness. And yet, people still do this to this day. They don't maybe uh, acknowledge what they're doing, but when they're bowing down to idols, and we're going we're, we're to say some more about this, they're just bowing down to an object made with their own hands. Again, Isaiah, they know nothing. They understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see. See, now Isaiah is just, just making fun of this stuff. He's really gotten to the point where he said all he really needs to say, but now he's just saying, look at how foolish this is. They, uh, their minds are closed so they cannot understand. No one stops to think. No one has the knowledge or understanding to say, half of it I use for fuel. I even bake bread over its coals. I roasted meat and I ate. Shall I make a detestable thing from what is left? Shall I bow down to a block of wood? Nonsense. And so the commandment is given that we shall not make an idol, because the idol is nothing. That's not how we worship Elohim. We don't use idols in our worship of Elohim. We don't bow down to idols and call upon idols. And yet, mankind, um, some religious systems, they still do that today. For I, Yahuwah, returning to Devarim, Deuteronomy 5, for I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am a jealous Elohim, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. He calls those who bow down to images those who hate me. Because if we're not willing to acknowledge who Elohim really is, and we try to attribute to the true Elohim qualities that, that we have cast with our own hands, then we're denying who He is, the very essence of who the Creator is, and we're trying to make Him up in our own image, in an image that's pleasing to us. And that's what human beings have done throughout history. They refuse to receive the revelation of the living Elohim, 
and they and they make their own image from their own imagination, and they bow down and worship that as God. Whoever does not acknowledge the true nature of the real and living Elohim, and instead casts him in the image of something else, surely must hate who or what Elohim is. Or why would they do that? They hate who he is. It's, it's a confrontation. Elohim is a confrontation and a rebuke to man living in his own ways. And so people reject that revelation. They reject the true Elohim who is righteous and just and faithful in all of his ways because they want to do things their way. They don't receive, and you know, Paul talks about this in Romans 1, you know all about that. They don't want to receive that revelation that Elohim has given of himself. And for this reason, they are to be punished because they have rejected the revelation of the living Elohim. And now I'm going to get uh, personal, and, and I, I really have to call out this practice um, that, that occurs in some Protestant churches, but is, uh, was really rooted in the universal church. And I have to call this out because this is what we're talking about today. And so, so here it goes. You know, I hope that people aren't offended by this, but I have to say what needs to be said. And I need to identify what people are doing in the name of religion. This is how the Catholics reason out uh, their idols and their images images of Mary and Joseph and the saints and, and other idols that they make with their hands. Uh, this is how they reason through this. Catholics defend their religious practice of kneeling, bowing, and praying in front of statues and images of Jesus, paintings, pictures and statues of Mary, statues and images of the saints, and the like. And they say, we aren't worshiping the statues and images. They only serve to remind us of God and of the persons whom the images represent. And so here's the reasoning, the justification for doing it, for praying in front of these things. The Catechism of the Catholic Church defends the practice of veneration of images in the Catholic Church in its explanation of this first of the ten matters. Their explanation begins thus. In section in, the, in this catechism, in section 2130, it reads, Nevertheless, already in the Old Testament, God ordained or permitted the making of images that pointed symbolically towards salvation by the incarnate word. See if you can follow this, this reasoning. So it was with the bronze serpent, the Ark of the Covenant, and the cherubim. Okay, so they justify carving images and bowing down before them because... Elohim had images, even within the, the tabernacle itself. The, what it was, well, the bronze serpent wasn't in the tabernacle, but it was something that was erected in order for people to look at and then, and then be healed of those snake bites in the wilderness. The Ark of the Covenant and the cherubim, the cherubim were images of these angels or cherubim that covered the Ark of the Covenant. And then there were pictures on the walls of cherubim and of other things, of pomegranates and, 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 and different things. And so the Catholic theologians said, because God has done this, we have the right to do it too. And so we can bow down and worship and pray in front of these images and idols. So it's true that, that Elohim did ordain these objects. But they were never objects of veneration, adoration, or worship. The things that Elohim set up were never to be bowed down to. He was to be bowed down to. He hovered over the Ark of the Covenant. The angels represented what, what appears in heaven, where the cherubim are, are like a covering over his throne in his presence. But people don't worship or never called to worship cherubim or angels or any other like things. Those are just the things that worship and bow down to him. Okay, and so we're given a picture of what Moses saw in heaven and he built the tabernacle according to the pattern he saw in heaven. And so there are cherubim there. And, um, 
hovering over the ark. So the bronze serpent was set up on a pole so that those who were bitten by the snakes could look at it and live and be healed of their snake bites. They were not instructed to bow down or to adore this bronze snake, even though later on in the history of Israel, the same bronze snake was used and misused as an object of worship, and people would come and, and, and bow down to this object. And it was the downfall of many, because it was not created for that purpose. The Ark of the Covenant and the Cherubim were not objects of worship either. The Ark was a container for the tablets of the Ten Matters written with the finger of Elohim. The cherubim were carved onto the top of the Ark. The one who sat between the cherubim on the top of the Ark of the Covenant was the one who was to be worshipped. So pointing to these objects as biblical precedents for the manufacture of other idol statues and symbols of adoration within the Catholic Church is like comparing apples and oranges. It just wasn't so. The objects ordained by Elohim were not done so to be worshipped or adored or prayed to, as are the objects in the Catholic Church. The Catechism, the Catholic Catechism goes on to say in section 2131, basing itself on the mystery of the incarnate word, the seventh, here, here, here's the authority by which the Catholic Church was making uh, these declarations. The Seventh Ecumenical Council of Nicaea of 787 of the Common Era justified against the iconoclasts the veneration of idols or icons of Christ, but also the Mother of God, Mary, the angels, and all the saints. And by becoming incarnate, the Son of God introduced a new economy of images. So there's a couple of problems here. Number one, they're basing their worship of Elohim upon a man-made council of, of people who were put together to agree with what the Catholic Church had already said. They were yes-men, agreeing with what was already established as a tradition of the Catholic Church. And secondly, there was no new economy of images. There was, uh, Messiah didn't come to create a new economy of things a new law of love, or anything new. The new covenant was new only in the sense that it was established on the basis of the blood of Messiah and rather than the blood of lambs and goats. And that the Torah, as a part of that new covenant, was written on our hearts and not just on stone anymore. It was the same agreement that Elohim would have this relationship with mankind based upon that same Torah that was going to be written on our hearts now. And we could, we could live in relationship with Him and in, in covenant agreement with Him by obeying those same instructions that He gave in the beginning because He never changed His mind about how to walk uprightly before Him. The instructions that He gave to us for life never changed. They're the same. Because He's righteous and He doesn't make mistakes. The, the laws that He gave were truly good and spiritual and for for our life. And so there was never any new economy of anything, including images, as this Council of Nicaea proclaimed. This justification for the use and veneration of images is illogical and without foundation. And I'm sorry I have to, to rebuke uh, the people that are in agreement with this theology, but it has to be done because we have to understand what Father has said as opposed to what men say and what men decree. First, the Catholic position is that by its own authority, the veneration of images is an acceptable practice, never mind what Elohim has said as recorded in the Bible. The Roman Catholic system acknowledges no other authority but their own, not even the authority of the Almighty when he makes a definitive declaration and the conclusion that, that they have reached. In other words, like we've described Judaism and rabbinical practice in the past, the Catholic Church does the same thing. They create their own body, uh, which they give authority to, to make changes to God's laws, to add to and subtract from, make wholesale changes in what Elohim has said, and they establish their own system of theology, their own walk, the, 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 the Judaism was the first to do this, and the Catholic Church has done the exact same thing by establishing their own religious system based upon their own authority without acknowledging Elohim. 
Because remember, we read that scripture, and we read, read that passage from the Talmud that says that they don't have to even listen to heaven. It's not up in heaven, they quote uh, Moses. It's not up in heaven that we have to go up and ask him to bring it down to us. And so the, the rabbis interpret that as meaning we don't go to Elohim any longer. He's given us authority to establish law, and so the, the rabbis are the new authority. Elohim has no more say. And that's exactly the Roman Catholic position, is that by their own authority, even God can't reverse what they decree to be so. There's the error of all false religion, is they proclaim an authority over that of Elohim and establish their own man-made customs and traditions, practices, law systems, based upon their own desire and their own authority. Second, did I finish that? Um, no, I didn't. Uh, the last sentence there, and they are content to stand by this judgment, the judgment of uh, allowing images into worship, because it is self-serving and that it keeps people paying homage to their own religious system, and it keeps people paying money into the coffers of the Catholic Church. Second, where is the ev evidence from Scripture that the Son of God introduced a new economy of images? That's like saying the rules have changed. They are teaching that Jesus altered the laws of God, but how is that possible? He himself had said that he only speaks what the Father has said. For didn't the Father say, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below? You shall not bow down to them, you shall not serve them. How then could Jesus change what the Father has declared? There is no new economy of images. What the Father spoke is the true authority. This is a concocted line of reasoning which has no scriptural support, but it serves the purposes of a corrupted church. Again, from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, section 2132, the Christian veneration of images is not contrary to the first commandment, which prescribes idols. Indeed, the honor rendered to an image passes to its prototype. And whoever venerates an image venerates the person portrayed in it. The honor paid to sacred images is a respectful veneration, not the adoration due to God alone. Religious worship is not directed to images in themselves, considered as mere things, but under their distinctive aspect as images, leading us on to God incarnate. The movement toward the image does not terminate in its usage, or in, excuse me, in it as image, but tends toward that whose image it is. And so here is the, the mind game they play. They're saying, you know, it's okay to bow down to these images because we're not really bowing down to an idol or an image. We're praying to or bowing down to the, the, the person that that image represents. And yet that justification still doesn't work because we're, people are doing exactly what Elohim said not to do. We're not to bow down. Because in bowing down to these images, what we're really bowing down to, and what people don't understand, is that there are sometimes spirits behind those images, but they're not the, the, the people that we think or that people think they're talking to. They're evil spirits. They're unclean spirits. And so people are actually bowing down to other Elohim when they do exactly what Elohim said not to do. By not following the instruction of Elohim about idols and images, people are bowing down to other Elohim. Unwittingly, maybe. Nevertheless, they're doing it. So whatever mind game, whatever... Uh, game that's going on uh, to get us to get their people to think otherwise the Catholic Church is leading people into worshiping other Elohim. Furthermore the fact that they believe that they're admiring or honoring the person who is represented by the image is another aspect of their transgression of the commandment to worship only Elohim. Many Catholics bow before a statue of Mary or of angels or other saints and pray to that one who is represented by the relic or they think they're praying to that one who is represented by the relic. 
But scripture indicates that there is only one mediator between God, Elohim, and men, the man, Messiah, Yahusha. And so whatever mediation they think is going on, and that's another thing that they say all the time, is, so, well, Mar Mary is closest to God. Mary is the mother of God. And so we go to her to mediate our requests to God because she's right next to him anyway. She can take our requests to him. But the scripture says that there's only one who mediates. And it's not Mary. It's our Messiah. He's the only mediator between us and Elohim. Thus, in praying to these other persons whom they contact through the idol, they are denying the Messiah is the only mediator. Another error in judgment. They are attributing prerogatives, including honor and esteem, to others which only Elohim possesses. So they're giving Mary, you know, Mary is blessed among women, and, it, and it's true, that she was a faithful follower and doer of the commandments. She pleased Elohim, and so she was chosen to be the mother of the Messiah. But she's still human, and she, she does not reach to the level of being prayed to. Amen. That's not an honor that was given to her. There's only one uh, mediator. So, what is... Here I'm breaking it down. Here's the bottom line about what people are doing when they're praying to idols. Calling upon these people by bowing and praying to their images amounts to witchcraft. Yes. <laughs> the prayers are incantations on the level of channeling. Channeling is trying to go to God by a different means other than that which he's authorized. It's using witches or, or, or spirits to communicate. So this channeling that people are doing when they are praying to idols is a communication through an illegal, unlawful method by talking to spirits. Believers are commanded not to inquire about other Elohim, but we are to ask him directly and he will answer. Another place, again, another place where we are shown that this is not uh, permitted by Elohim, that he has commanded us directly not to channel, not to go by other means, not to use other approaches to try to get an answer from God. But we ask him directly. We don't go through other spirits and mediums and witches, because all that is uh, that, that kind of sin, that kind of channeling or approach to communicate with Elohim has attached to it the death penalty because it's an abomination because Elohim knows that what we're really doing and we don't, or what people are doing and we're not doing it, but what people do is they're actually speaking to evil spirits and they're channeling and they're using witchcraft to get answers. As the bowing down before the images is a gesture of bowing to Mary or the saints, well, that too is wrong according to the scriptures. First note that what Yohanan, or John in the book of Revelation, dropped down on his knees to honor the messenger of Yahweh, who was showing him the visions of the book of Revelation. The messenger responded to him, and, and he says this, and when I heard and when I had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me, but he said to me, do not do it, I am a fellow servant with you, and with your brothers, the prophets, and of all who keep the words of this book, worship Elohim. So even this mighty angel who had come to bring revelation to John would not accept John bowing down and worshiping him. There are no created beings that have been given that honor that we are to bow down to them or to pray to them so that they can take our request to Elohim. We're to worship Elohim and Elohim alone. <clears throat> Elohim has commanded us not a few times in the instructions of his word to have nothing to do with the carved images and idols of the pagan nations who do not know him. In fact, we are to destroy from our midst all vestiges of this kind of false worship, for this is what he instructed his ancient people. And here's the quote from Shemot, Exodus 34. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land where you are going, or they will be a snare to you. Break down their altars, smash their set-apart stones, cut down their Asherah poles. Do not worship any other god, 
for Yahuwah, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous Elohim. And this calls to mind what we see in the first word. He said, the reason we're not to make idols and bow down is he's a jealous Elohim. He doesn't accept that. Because what we're really doing is we're worshiping, worshiping somebody else in his name. Pretending or thinking that may, we may be worshiping him. Destroy completely. Here's Devering, Deuteronomy 12. Destroy completely all the places on the high mountains and on the hills and under every spreading tree where the nations you are dispossessing worship their gods. <clears throat> Break down their altars, smash their set-apart stones, and burn their Asherah poles in the fire. Cut down the idols of their gods and wipe out their names from those places. You must not worship Yahweh your Halloween in their way. So here again, this kind of brings conclusion <clears throat> and substance and clarity to the instruction to have no other Elohim. Because people are, are inclined to do that. They're inclined to attribute to something that they can see. They can set their eyes on this thing. And they think it's helping them to understand who the true Elohim is and to communicate with the true Elohim. And yet, what they're really unwittingly doing is worshiping evil spirits and transgressing the clear instruction. Okay, let's move on to the second matter. The second matter of the Big Ten is Devarim 5.11. You shall not lift up the name of Yahweh your Elohim unto emptiness. For Yahweh will not hold anyone guiltless who lifts up his name unto emptiness. <clears throat> the second matter of the covenant between Yahweh and his people has to do with the proper use of his name. Elohim is holy and the name of Elohim is holy. And therefore, the misuse of his name is out of bounds. Yahweh will hold anyone who profanes his name accountable. So let's look at a little bit of Hebrew here. The verb lo tisa, employed in this instruction is the Hebrew, uh, comes from the Hebrew root nasa, which means to lift up, carry, uh, take, lift up or take away. And an interesting, I don't know if this is a, uh, is a coincidence, but uh, yeah, uh, the 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 group that uh, is trying to take us into outer space is, calls themselves NASA because they're lifting up into outer space or at least they say they are you know I, I still have doubts about the moon landing but that's just me I'm a conspiracy theorist <laughs> so anyway NASA means to lift or to carry up NASA yeah it refers to the invoking this lifting up of the name is a reference to invoking his name, using his name to make an oath. Is the is kind of like the basic meaning of lifting up his name. Where many English Bible translations render the text in vain, the Hebrew shavah can mean uh, to convey emptiness, vanity, or falsehood. So when we lift up or, or take an oath in his name, but our purpose is is not to keep that oath. By using his name, we're calling upon all who he is, because this is his name of, of renown, the name by which he's to be remembered. When we use Yahweh or Yehovah, or however we pronounce his name, and we lift that up in an oath, then, uh, then we need to carry out whatever it is that we're promising by taking this oath, because by not doing so, we're saying his name is empty, his character is empty. He's unable to defend himself. And we, can, we can use his name to, to lie to somebody or unto vanity, unto emptiness, and it doesn't matter. But he, he takes this very seriously when we use his name to take oaths and we're expected to carry out all of our oaths. The theological word book of the Old Testament goes on to say that the primary meaning is of Shahweh is emptiness or vanity. No one can challenge. No one can challenge. I mean, this is the primary meaning of Shaveh, or Shaveh, they say in, in modern Hebrew, Shaveh. It designates anything that is unsubstantial, unreal, worthless, either materially or morally. And so also, it is used in this instruction. The evidence points to the fact that taking the Lord's name, this reputation in vain, will surely cover profanity, as that term is understood today, or swearing falsely in the Lord's name. So lifting up his name includes 
any misuse of his name to misrepresent him, but it will also in include uh, using the names Lord lightly, unthinkingly, or by rote. So, so those who lift up the name Yahweh in vain will not be held guiltless, he says. The Hebrew there just means to be cleared or freed or innocent. And so if we do this, if we lift up his name, he will, not, he will punish, he will surely punish because he doesn't take this lightly. It's his name and his reputation that he's protecting. And by allowing anyone to use his name unto vanity or emptiness, <clears throat> is to allow his reputation and his personhood to be uh, damaged or blasphemed or disrespected. And thus, who, those who violate this command will be held accountable. So here's a couple of scriptures about taking an oath in, in his name, because the Torah does instruct us to do this. When Whatever oath we take, we're to take it in his name, so that by virtue of his name and his reputation, we're responsible to carry out our oaths. And here's Devarim, Deuteronomy 6.13, Fear Yahweh your Elohim, serve him only and take your oaths in his name. Again, Deuteronomy 10.20, Fear Yahweh your Elohim and serve him, hold fast to him, and take your oaths in his name. To take an oath in the name of Yahweh is to guarantee the trustworthiness of the oath you are essentially presented, presenting the reputation and character of Yahweh as proof of the reliability of the oath you're taking. And thus the Torah commands us to take our oaths in his name. Again, Leviticus, Vayikra 19, you must not swear falsely in my name, so that you do not profane the name of your Elohim. I am Yahweh. Deuteronomy 23, when you make a vow to Yahweh your Elohim, he must not delay in fulfilling it, for otherwise he will surely hold you accountable as a sinner. By not fulfilling a vow, we're taking his name in vain, because we promised in his name that we would keep that vow, that oath. If a man makes a vow to Yahweh or takes an oath of binding obligation on himself, he must not break his word, but he must do whatever he has promised. There's a couple other uh, passages of, that hang off of this commandment that help us to understand. And here in Vayikra, Leviticus uh, 24, it describes an incident whereby the son of a woman of Israel blasphemed the name with a curse. And here the word uh, translated blaspheme is nakav. And so they brought him to Moshe. His mother's name was Shalomit, the daughter of Divri and the Danite. I think I neglected to put in uh, a definition for the word nakav. Nakav is a Hebrew word that actually makes, means to make an indentation or to hew out, kind of similar to what they do with idols, but to make an indentation or to damage something. And uh, modern day uh, rabbis say that nakav means to mispronounce and that's where how they support uh, this idea of them never speaking the name of Yahweh but they always substitute Adonai or Hashem because they don't want to misspeak his name mispronounce his name and so bring a curse upon themselves and they say the word nakav actually means that but it doesn't I'm just going to tell you it's not true because nakhav, you search the word nakhav out in the Old Testament scriptures and it always means to damage or to cut into something. Um, it, it even has reference to a cave, something that is cut out. You know, a cave, a cut out of a, of a rock. That's what nakhav means. So the idea of blaspheme, blaspheming with uh, this Hebrew word nakhav means to to, to damage something or to cut out or cut into something to uh, misform it or, or to you know make a hole in it. So they brought him, this, this son who blasphemed and they put him in custody until the will of Yahweh should be made clear to them. And then Yahweh said to Moshe, take the blasphemer outside the camp. All those who heard him are to lay their hands on his head and the entire assembly is to stone him. Say to the sons of Israel, if anyone curses his Elohim 
he will be held responsible. Anyone who blasphemes the name of Yahweh must be put to death. The entire assembly must stone him, whether an alien or native born. When he blasphemes the name, he must be put to death. And so this is what the, the second word of the ten words means when it says that Elohim will not hold him guiltless who misuses his name. The death penalty is attached to this kind of misuse, blaspheming, uh, damaging, making an indentation or, or an alteration to the character of Elohim by misusing his name. In another place, uh, a different Hebrew word is used in Shemot or Exodus 22, 28, an instruction is given, do not blaspheme Elohim or curse the ruler of your people. And this Hebrew word is kalal. The word kalal is listed in the lexicons as having the meaning of to be, to be slight, to be small or swift, trifling, of little account. So what, we're, so what this word means, where it's translated blaspheme, is to belittle or lessen the power of his name. Here, mimicking the name Yahweh is prohibited, much like they express in to take the name in vain. Kalal indicates an emptying or diminishing of the honor and dignity deserving of Yahweh's name. So, in, in this case, the idea of, of uh, slighting him, or misusing him, or even making fun of him is to, is to diminish him. And that too is prohibited by the commandment. That's taking the name in vain. Yet one more Hebrew word in our examination of this expression is complete. Uh, do not profane my holy name. This is Vayikra or Leviticus 22.32. And here the Hebrew word is halal. Do not profane halal my holy name. I must be acknowledged as holy by the sons of Israel. I am Yahweh who makes you holy. So very similar to nakhav, the one that means to make an indent or to damage. Uh, halal also means to wound sometimes fatally, or bore through, or pierce through. In contrast to the sloppy, disrespectful way the world handles the holy name, Yahweh demands from his people that they keep his name honored and set apart. And so that's the gist of the second commandment, do not take his name in vain. Several ap applications of that instruction. And now the third matter of the Big Ten, and, and we're going to complete our study today with this third matter. And it comes from Devarim 5, verses 12 through 15. Guard the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as Yahweh your Elohim has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to Yahweh your Elohim. You shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor the alien within your gates, so that your manservant and maidservant may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Mitzrayim, and that Yahweh your Elohim brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And therefore Yahweh your Elohim has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. In the Exodus version, it says, For in six days Yahuwah made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day, and therefore Yahuwah blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So note the, the differences between the Deuteronomy version. It's because Yahuwah brought you out of Egypt that he has the right to command you to keep the Sabbath day holy. And in the Exodus version, it's because Yahuwah made heaven and earth that he has the right command you to keep the Sabbath day holy. And both are true. He did create heaven and earth and he established the seventh day as a memorial of who he is. Anybody who believes in, in the creation of heaven and earth in six days surely should be keeping the Sabbath day because this is his signature mark on the creation that he's the one who did it in six days. And so creationists should uh, logically also be Sabbath keepers. And yet they're not. It's, it's, it's kind of strange and illogical. But not all creationists acknowledge him in the seventh day. 
But that's what he established, and that's the authority by which he commands us to keep the Sabbath day, is that he created heaven and earth. Oops, let's read the rest of this. And thus the heavens and the earth, and this is from Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, establishing at creation that Elohim rested from his work on the seventh day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array, but the seventh day, by the seventh day, Elohim had finished the work he had been doing. And so on the seventh day he rested from all of his work. And Elohim blessed the seventh day and sanctified or separated it. He made it holy because on it he had rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Again, this is the signature of the creation and identifying who the creator is. It's the one who rested on the seventh day. And by, and by connecting to that same worship that he calls us to, resting on the seventh day and, and acknowledging him, we are acknowledging that he's the creator of heaven and earth. The commandment tells us in Devering 5 to guard the Sabbath day and in uh, Shemot or Exodus, uh, Exodus 20, he tells us to remember the Sabbath day. The reason we should be doing this is that Elohim rested and I guess this is kind of a repeat of what I just explained. The seventh day was to always have a special and unique agenda for mankind made in the image of Elohim because he created it for a special purpose. He separated that seventh day from the other six in order to establish a different type of activity that was to occur on the seventh day. For the, for the first six days, we were to do all of our work and all of our labor but on the seventh day, a different type of day with a different purpose, we are to rest from our labor and acknowledge Him as the Creator and acknowledge Him as Lord in our lives and do the things that please Him. And that's how we do it, by doing what He instructed us to do. It always comes right back around to that, is that how do we acknowledge that He is Elohim? It's by doing what He commanded us to do. How do we acknowledge that He's the Creator? by doing what he told us to do on the seventh day. The other six days of the week are appointed by the Creator to be days of labor, but the seventh day is to be separated from the other six in order to experience the fellowship of Elohim that he created us for. So we come to experience the very purpose for which he made us in not only in the six days of doing all of our work, but in the seventh day specifically by connecting back with him and acknowledging him for who he is, the creator of, se of heaven and earth. Why does the creator ask us to do this and how can he demand it of us? Again, I've, I've already alluded to this. He has the right to command us because he created us and he redeemed us. He did everything for us that we could not do for ourselves. We can't create the way that he creates and yet we're created by Him and in His image. We can't save from sin like He saves from sin. And yet He is the one that saves from sin. He's the one that rescued our ancestors out of the bondage of Egypt, which is a prototype or a foreshadowing of the Messiah's redemption that He accomplished by His blood on the tree to save us from our sins, from our transgressions. And so Elohim's the only one who can perform these things, and therefore he has the right to command us to keep the seventh day holy. But he, and this is uh, this is further more on that point. So one more scripture, and then I'm going to conclude with some statements about the Sabbath day from the Catholic Church. Here's the statement in Exodus 31. Say to the sons of Israel, you must observe my Sabbaths. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come, so that you may know that I am Yahweh, who makes you holy. Observe the Sabbath because it is holy to you. Anyone who desecrates it must be put to death, and whoever does any work on that day must be cut off from his people. For six days work is to be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, holy to Yahweh. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day must be put to death. The sons of Israel are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for the generations to come, as a lasting covenant. It's a covenant. It's an agreement. 
between mankind and the Creator. That we're to keep the seventh day holy as, as, uh, as a means of acknowledging Him as, our, as the true Elohim and Creator. It will be a sign between me and the sons of Yisrael forever. Or the Hebrew is probably uh, Le'olam Va'ed, which our brother pointed out means unto the age and even beyond. Um, the, the translation of forever may be questionable, but it does mean as far as we can see into the future, this covenant holds true for Elohim's people. So it will be a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever, for in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he abstained from work and rested. And so we're doing what the Creator has established from creation for mankind. We're doing it out of allegiance and obedience to the Almighty. And it's something, it's a commandment or a covenant that never has an end. His people throughout the history of mankind and, and beyond are, are required to keep this covenant of the Seventh-day Sabbath as a means of, of coming into agreement with the Almighty. So here's some statements about why uh, Sabbath became Sunday in the Christian Church. And they're very straightforward and plain to understand. This comes from uh, James Cardinal Gibbons in The Faith of Our Fathers, 88th edition, page 89. He claims the sanctification of Sunday is an act of the Catholic Church. He's, and it reads this way, but you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday, a day which we never sanctify. And this is the Catholic Church, because you remember, they, are on, they, they run under uh, their own authority and they don't acknowledge the authority of the scriptures or of Elohim. So the, they, they come right out and admit that they don't sanctify the seventh day as Elohim did. They sanctify the Sunday because by their own authority they declared it to be so. And there was no other authority other than their own authority that established Sunday as the day to be sanctified and, and to worship Elohim. Another statement um, by the same man um, it could not have been otherwise, as none in those days would have dreamed of doing anything in, in matters spiritual and ecclesiastical and religious without her, meaning the Catholic Church. And the act is a mark of ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. So just as Yahweh says that the Sabbath, the Seventh-day Sabbath, is a sign to his people that he's the one that has the authority and the ability to make men holy, the Catholic Church is saying that by changing the solemnity of the Sabbath to Sunday is their mark of authority in ecclesiastical or church power and religious matters. So they just admit it again that they're not listening to what God has said. They're establishing this by their own authority and it's a mark of their authority. It's the sign of their authority that, that they did this thing, they changed Sabbath to Sunday, and everyone falls in line, and even the Protestants follow after the Catholic Church in this matter, because there's no authorization by Scripture that Sunday became the new Sabbath day. And another one from a doctrinal catechism by Stephen Keenan. Question, have you any other way of proving that the Church has power to institute festivals of precept or law? festivals of law. And the answer given is, had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. Again, the Catholic Church claiming that they're the ones that did it by their authority, not by the authority of Elohim or of the scriptures. And uh, one more, I think, I think I only have one more. Protestants accept Sunday rather than Saturday as the day for public worship after the Catholic Church made the change. But the Protestant mind does not seem to realize that an, that 
in accepting the Bible and observing the Sunday, they are accepting the authority of the spokesman for the church, the Pope. Amen. So, there's no other way around it that Elohim has established, and it will continue on as a covenant forever, for His people, for the children of Israel, that the seventh day is a day that we separate and acknowledge Him as Creator. But the religious institutions, by their own authority, have established a different day of the week. And there is no biblical authority for it. So the first three matters of the ten matters of the covenant are all about how Elohim is calling us to worship Him by having no other mighty ones in, up in His face, by not lifting up His name unto emptiness, and by keeping the Sabbath day holy. Those are the big three that he wants to see from his people. And, and the Sabbath is something that has been diminished in, uh, in, in many Christian places. But the scripture is very clear that this is Elohim's will. And from his mind and from his reference point, keeping the Sabbath is, is one of the three most important things we can do to worship him. And so let's cut it off there. And